Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC Guy. Today on the DCC Guy, I want to talk about filters and chokes. Let's take a look at just what they are, what do they look like, uh, why are they there, uh, what do they do as far as interfering with your decoders, and finally, what can you do about them. So, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so the first question is, what are they? Well, let me show you a few examples. Now, this particular board here, and I'm going to hold it up close to the camera, uh, you can see there's a capacitor right down here. It's this little mustard uh, yellow thing. And then there's a couple of coils with a black center here. You can see these. Okay, this is the capacitor filter, and these are chokes. Okay, so get a good close-up of those, and you can see those. Um, you can also see the same type of thing. I believe this board here came out of a Bachmann 44 tonner. It has the same capacitors and the same uh, coils here that are the chokes. Um, another one. This is another one. A much smaller setup. You know, it's built around an 8-pin plug. It's got the same uh, capacitor here for the filter and then the two chokes. One for each leg of the circuit. And let's see, oh, let's finally look at this. This is a Bachmann uh, 060, it's a UK prototype, and you can see right here soldered across the motor brush leads is one of these little mustard color capacitors. And then there's a couple of uh, resistors also in the circuit. I'm not sure whether those resistors are there as part of that uh, filtering circuit, or if they're there to just limit the amount of current and get to the motor. So these are very common in a lot of uh, a lot of model locomotives. These are are not limited just to Bachmann. There's a lot of other motors that have them. I imagine they're built into a lot of the uh, circuit boards that come with uh, model uh, model locomotives these days. Uh, but why are they there? Um, if you have ever looked at an open frame motor, you might have noticed when it's running that there's sparks shooting off from the brush contacts where they uh, make contact with the commutators. And that uh, arcing effect is what creates something called radio frequency electromagnetic interference. So it's basically creating electronic noise, and it was found that that could interfere with radio and TV uh, signals and with reception. So the result was that many governments put restrictions on uh, makers of DC motor uh, appliances, and they required that they install these capacitors and, and uh, chokes uh, in order to eliminate uh, that uh, radio frequency and EMI interference. Basically what they do is they filter across the motor uh, brush contacts, and that's what that uh, capacitor does that, that I showed you, and they eliminate certain frequencies of uh, electromagnetic uh, noise that is emitting from those motors. And the same thing, the, the, the chokes uh, perform a similar function in, in uh, reducing this type of ma electromagnetic interference. So that's why they're there. Um, more recently, though, with digital television and radio and, and that kind of thing, uh, EMI is less and less of a problem. Uh, also, uh, manufacturers of motors have made a lot of improvements in them. So one thing, if you look at this Bachmann motor, you see it's got a metal case, okay? Makers have been doing this for a long time. Athern, you know, very early started uh, prov uh, providing a metal case around their motors. And the great thing about metal cases is, is they prevent a lot of that noise from radiating out from the motor. Uh, one problem is, though, with most of these motors, they have a plastic cap here that uh, the uh, motor brushes are set into. And so you can still get some leakage out that way as well. So that's why they still put these capacitors on the Bachmann uh, locomotives across the motor brushes. And sometimes you'll actually see a capacitor from the motor, uh, running from the motor brush to the motor case, and the same on the other side. So they're using two of them. So... These things, hopefully, are, are, are well chosen, properly designed, so that they only um, eliminate and filter out the types of electromagnetic noise that interferes with radio and television and other types of, of, of devices.
And, you know, they're still making these for a lot of markets in the EU market, the European market, which the UK is part of still, uh, as far as the market goes. Um, they still require these things to be on um, any kind of DC motor. Therefore, Bachmann, which is a big maker worldwide, still uh, puts these um, filters and chokes on their uh, models for the UK in particular, and I assume all of Europe, and you even find them on the American market. That's why, you know, I found it on this Bachmann uh, Light Mountain or uh, 280 uh, board, and also on the GE44 Tonner board. So certain manufacturers that have to produce a, a lot of their models for the EU market still use these filters and chokes. In the American market, um, I don't ever remember seeing them on uh, locomotives from like Athern and from Atlas and uh, from uh, Inner Mountain and, and probably some of the other Bowser maybe. Um, I just, I think, and, and I'm not sure, I don't remember seeing them on the lifelike circuit boards, but there's so many components on some of those lifelike circuit boards, it's hard to know just what's what. But I've never seen any of these little, uh, these little metal coils like, like on this one here that form those uh, chokes. At any rate, that's why they're there. They are still required by many governments. However, the big secret is it's not illegal to remove them. So let me go ahead and start talking about what they do to decoders. With most modern decoders, they are dependent on using back EMF. Now, back EMF electromotive force is a, a method that allows the decoder to uh, monitor how fast a locomotive is going and to adjust its speed accordingly to stay at a constant speed. So it's basically uh, called cruise control for model trains. Um, the way it works is DCC decoders use pulse width modulation. That is, the power is sent out in pulses. And you can see the wave. If you look at my little logo here, you can see that it's a series of waves of power going out to the track. So you'll have a certain time that the power is on and then off on and off, on and off. That's called pulse width modulation. And in those pulses, in between those power pulses, there are periods where there's no power going to the motor itself. And if you've ever known anything, experimented with motors and generators, you know that a DC motor is just a DC generator working in reverse. And if you spin a DC uh, motor by hand, it will put out a small current. And that current is what the, the back EMF circuitry in a decoder is, is actually uh, monitoring. So that's how it knows. If, if the power is coming more frequently and um, larger pulses, then it knows that it's going faster. And if it's slowing down, those will change as well. So it's very important for most modern decoders that use and depend on back EMF that they be able to see that power pulse coming back to them. And one of the problems with these uh, capacitors and, and chokes is they can filter out that back EMF. And therefore, your, your motor control degrades quickly. And the same goes also, though, for the pulse width modulation, is they can mess with the pulses. And so, you know, you've got two things that are not working right. Uh, back last fall, I got this locomotive from England. It's produced by Oxford Rail, the makers of Oxford die-cast metal uh, cars, and it's a really nice little locomotive. It runs very well, but it didn't when I first got it. Why? Uh, it didn't run very well at the time because it has a cordless motor, and cordless motors are very high efficient uh, motors, um, but they can be very difficult for some uh, decoders to control. And as a matter of fact, with this particular locomotive, one uh, company in the UK that does DCC installations found that they had to remove the uh, daggone little uh, board from the tender uh, because it was interfering so much that a Zemo decoder would not even work with this locomotive. In my case, I tried it with the original uh, low sound decoder that came with it, and it didn't run very well at low speeds. It lurched and jerked and things of that nature. 
And that was, I believe, due to the back EMF interference, as well as the fact that it was a coreless motor. The decoder just couldn't deal with those two factors simultaneously. I eventually put a Soundtrax decoder in it, and it runs great now. So, uh, what then do you do? Well, if, as in this particular case, the capacitor is simply soldered across the motor leads, I just take a pair of wire cutters and clip the two legs on that uh, capacitor, and it's gone. It's done for. Uh, more often, I also tear out the circuit board and wire everything directly to the uh, decoder itself. And that way, I get rid of any kind of circuitry that's in between me or between the decoder and the motor itself. So, like, that's why I have all of these little circuit boards here. They're not in the locomotives and tenders anymore uh, because I take them out. And as I said, as far as I have been able to determine, and everywhere I've seen this backs me up, it's not illegal to remove these. It's just required that manufacturers put them in. Like I said, it's easy to go ahead and just clip the leads on these capacitors, but make sure you get the right capacitors, okay? Like on this Bachman, it's got uh, a little M next to that uh, area on the pad that indicates it's the motor uh, uh, circuit, and you can just clip it right out of there. But, you know, be careful. You might just want to clip one leg at a time, and that way, if you find your decoder stops working, you can go back and solder that leg together if you've clipped the wrong capacitor. Okay, so that's one of the problems. Uh, what about choke coils here? Well, unfortunately, those choke coils are part of the motor, or part of the circuit in this device, or in this circuit board. So you can't just clip those and remove them. What you can do is clip one end and remove uh, half of it, or most of it, and then just solder the two wires back together again. Or you can clip them out and put a jumper on the circuit board across that particular part of the circuit. And that will keep the circuit alive, but it will remove these chokes from the circuit. And that way it won't interfere with your decoder any longer. Um, the easiest thing, I think, though, is to just take the darn things out and wire it directly. You can hook your daggone um, orange and gray leads directly to the motor brushes. These are usually wired, and you can splice those together, and you're good to go. And I have found that that is probably the easiest way because that way you don't have to sweat how much, uh, uh, you know, whether or not you're removing the wrong component from the circuit board. So that's, that's what I do. That's how I deal with it. Um, some of the potential downsides. I have read that sometimes, some frequencies of this RF and, and EMI noise can interfere with potentially Wi-Fi signals, Bluetooth signals, and other high-frequency signals of that type. So, you know, be aware of this and be aware that, you know, if you're having problems after you install a decoder with lurching and, and, and the like in low speeds, suspect that you've got an, uh, an, um, a problem there with a choke or a filter somewhere in that locomotive, somewhere on the circuit board, and, you know, look for it. So that does it for this week, and uh, have a good weekend. Stay healthy and safe, and we'll see you maybe the first of the week, probably more likely the end of next week. Take it easy now. Bye.